look, as I said, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for organizing this. And I think I've already heard some uh, very, very inspiring speakers um, in relation to really what's happening in the world of sports and technology, which is really the subject uh, that I wanted to talk a little bit about. I, I know you and I have an interview straight after. So, uh, you know, hopefully between that uh, part and this part, we'll be able to cover uh, most of the bases. What I'd like to do generally when I uh, do so panel discussions, I would like to sort of spend five, 10, maybe 15 minutes on, on the things that I find very, very interesting, and exciting that I'm working on, and then really allow you and the rest of the audience to ask questions in order to make it a little bit more interactive, because uh, I could probably speak for hours on this subject matter, but we have a limited time. Um, so just a little bit of the background. So I have uh, been in sort of M&A space for a long time. I did master's in mathematics at Bologna and here in Sussex in the United Kingdom and really spent uh, a couple of decades working on various deal structures around the world. Uh, but in the sort of sport was always something that I was um, fascinated by in the business and investment sense, but also I grew up with. I played handball at the national level as a junior. Lots of my uh, uh, teammates ended up going to Croatia, winning the world uh, championships and Olympic gold. So I kind of grew up around football and handball and other sports in the former Yugoslavia at the time. Then when I was a teenager, I moved to the United Kingdom. So I've been in London for the last 30 years. And really, in the last few years, through various initiatives I took myself, including the Formula E racing, uh, one of uh, a good friends and the business partners of mine, Edmund Chu, owns the most successful Formula E team called the Cheetah. He also owns the Vizela Football Club in Portugal, the Andorra with Pique in Spain. Uh, they recently bought the Davis Cup rights. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, and they're doing lots and lots of interesting things around tennis. And at least, uh, and also last but not least, he also owns 13% of the City Football Group, which he took to China. So really um, working a lot with Edmund, uh, going to sort of promote the future of the Formula racing. Uh, obviously, we all know about Formula One, but uh, I'm a great believer in Formula E, not just because of sustainability, and technology, but also I think we live in the day and age in 2021 when, uh, you know, there is a new oils uh, which are no longer uh, the old sort of oil countries uh, uh, that, that are actually taking a, a huge uh, a sort of uh, stride towards the, the, the technology and innovation. But it is media, it is content, it is data. I mean, I've read lots of books about the actual new oil is data. It's the, it's the content is the new king. So if you look at all these interesting aspects, and if you look at what's happened in the last 24 months uh, due to COVID, uh, we have seen a huge, huge emergence of the sports tech or any form of tech, including the health tech, which I often take a, a huge sort of parallels between what's happening in the health industry what's happening in the sports industry and how uh, data is becoming uh, such an important element to optimize athletes, to optimize the sort of even the performance of the clubs. You know, a very good friend of mine, Rasmus Ankesen, who's the director of football of Brentford and chairman at Michelin in Denmark, uh, has become known as the data man in the football industry because uh, he's managed to showcase how uh, uh, small clubs that are not as well funded as Man City, as Chelsea's, Arsenal's of the world, can really perform and outperform you know, the, the clubs that are worth hundreds of millions. So, uh, you know, I recently, uh, almost a year ago, became chairman of the biggest Bosnian football club, Željeznicar in Sarajevo. And uh, one of the important things when I came on board as the chairman to look at the next 100 years of the club, because the club is celebrating 100-year anniversary this year. The likes of Edin Dzeko came out of this club, so he has produced the talent that is playing at the top level of football. Dzeko was at Man City, now he's at Inter, he played at Roma a few months ago. You know, I, I thought, okay, um, we can either do one of the two things. We can bring the Ajax Football Academy model, because the Balkans, as we all know, is very, very 
uh, a sort of uh, talented when it comes down to the Red Star Belgrade, Dinamo Zagreb, Partizan. And these academies that I have visited on numerous occasions have proven to be very, very strong and even stronger than the likes of uh, La Messia or Barcelona and Ajax. But uh, I felt, yes, that's definitely the, the road that the club should go down to and really re-engage with the youth academy. But also sports technology was my driving motivator to actually bring the club to the global level and the global attention. And, uh, you know, through a very, very uh, lucky sort of encounter with uh, one of my other partners, Sam Lee, who was uh, instrumental in doing some of the biggest NBA deals in Asia on behalf of NBA many, many years ago. Uh, he's introduced me to what I would call uh, some of the most innovative sports tech companies, uh, such as one of your previous speakers mentioned, Socios and Chili's, uh, and the likes of Block Sport, uh, Seiyu, Home Fans, and most importantly, Result Sports. Now, I have immersed myself in understanding how sports technology is changing today's world of football and also the world of sport. So as a result of that, I just went on to my own journey. I met the founders and the major investors behind all of these companies, and I have really introduced uh, the power of sports technology into the club uh, that has a huge fan base, a million plus fans for the small country, and a relatively small city uh, and, and sort of push them in the direction of innovation and pioneering. Uh, why did I do that? Is because I've realized that uh, in past the COVID times, uh, football and sport will never be the same again. I think uh, we've all seen with the fan engagement that, uh, you know, not being able to go to the stadiums, not being able to uh, go and support your, your beloved clubs, be it football, basketball, handball, whatever it is, uh, it just kind of uh, gave us a, a different avenue to look through and how we could still remain engaged with the club, what it is that we can demand from the clubs, because the clubs have also got the responsibility towards uh, their fan bases, towards the society, and they also need to continue promoting uh, what I would say a, a, a well-being and physical activities, because too many kids around the world, billions look up to the footballers, basketball players, handball players as role models. So what the clubs are starting to see that there's a certain element of the education is incredibly important. So I recently joined a company, German company, uh, Result Sport as a chief strategy officer and sit on the board in order to promote this uh, digital uh, transformation and digitalization of the, of the sports element around the world. I mean, Mario Leo, the founder of Result Sports, has been a digital strategy of Borussia Dortmund since 2009. So you can imagine now we are in 2021. However, Borussia realized the importance of digital strategy 12, 13 years ago. That is, you know, in today's day and age, uh, totally pioneering and innovative. Uh, Result Sports has got the likes of UEFA, Juventus, Man City, and many other major clubs, federations, and leagues. And I really, our ultimate goal and aim when it comes down to Result Sports is to turn it into the Boston Consulting of digital strategy for the sports industry. And it's not only football, because we work with, with federations in handball, in basketball, and around the world, from Africa all the way to, to uh, Caspian Sea and Asian part of the world, all the way to Europe and soon America. So I uh, sort of really pushed elements of my own understanding and learning in the direction of digital transformation. And I also joined the board of the Block Sport, uh, which is another sports tech company, which in my view has pretty much 360 degree offering when it comes down to both individual athletes and the sporting uh, a sort of entities such as clubs, uh, football clubs, leagues and federations. And, you know, a main differential which I see between block sport and socios is the fact that the block sport enables through its mobile app, uh, its uh, club or clients to really integrate all aspects of the fun engagements, fun missions, and also assist their sponsors 
and betting partners into the fully integrated system that will create a new revenue stream. I think one of the most important and most challenging things for both clubs and athletes is new revenues. It's something I call new money because the existing or the old way of making money as a club would be obviously through the player transfer fees uh, and also through the uh, sale of tickets, sponsorship deals. However, the sports tech is enabling clubs today, however small or large their fund base is, to create new revenues. In addition to that, as some of your uh, speakers previously touched on uh, the importance of uh, tokenization, so the block sports sort of part two and part three has introduced the fund tokens on behalf of the clubs linked to the major crypto exchanges and of course nfts that everyone is talking about because i think we've seen a huge emergence of the uh, sort of uh, sporting legends investing and coming on board of actually uh, nft companies and platforms fund token companies and, and platforms and of course all those who are innovating and, and sort of pioneering in the whole space. So I just want to sort of uh, maybe bring to, to everyone's attention the fact that, you know, I'm a great believer in what's happening in today's day and age. I think the next 10 years are very exciting for the world of sport, world of football in particular, uh, uh, for the main reason that we have the World Cup next year in Qatar. We have in 2026 USA and Mexico, and likely Asian country to be in 2030 is China. Now, think of it from the sort of uh, consumer viewpoint. These are the biggest markets in the world. They consume content, they consume and are really hungry for the, you know, the, the sort of know-how transfer, especially when it comes down to the Asian market. And um, the biggest media companies have always been in the United States. Uh, even we've seen the emergence of Rock Nations that was really conceived by Jay-Z as a music record label going into the world of sport with the likes of Kevin De Bruyne, Lukaku and Sam Rashford, some of the big names in the world of football because uh, things are really now exciting and they're merging and they're crossing over. And this is why I often say, you know, you really have to understand um, as a you know, the, the chairman of the football club, uh, now as somebody who's also an investor and entrepreneur and executive in the sports tech space, we really need to understand what the future holds. And that cannot be uh, the system of the old or just the system of the new. I'm a great believer that the combination of the old and the new is going to be the golden formula for success behind many sporting uh, clubs around the world and individual athletes, because the athletes have realized that apart from making money off the back of their commercial deals, endorsements, and, and, and sort of players' wages, they really have an opportunity to engage with their fans through the uh, power of tokenization and digitalization and commercialization. And that's, a, that's an exciting place to be. I think what we need to do, we need to now see the shift of the agents' minds who often control uh, the decision-making powers around the players to also understand and fully embrace it rather than stop it. We have the same issues and challenges with the clubs that don't often fully understand the power of sports technology, and they're trying to figure out uh, the sort of the revenue model off the back of the old ways of making money. So, you know, what's obviously a challenge is the element of education. I do a lot of work in the Balkans. I'm flying over to Belgrade next week. We're talking to the likes of Red Star, Belgrade, Partizan, uh, football and basketball. These are the clubs that have produced some of the you know, biggest football stars uh, in the world, biggest basketball stars in the world who have ended up in NBA uh, as sort of drafted on a regular basis. And uh, even the likes of... Um, Jan Vlahovic, who's now the probably most sought after 21 year old in the world of football. The Man City wants him, Arsenal wants him, West Ham wants him, uh, lots, and even Newcastle, who has recently had a huge influx of the biggest uh, investor in the world of Premiership football as, as part of their investment uh, infrastructure, are keen. You know, this is a kid who's 21, who's incredibly talented. Everyone's talking about him being the new Ibrahimovic. Uh, you know, it's not easy to make that huge step from Fiorentina 
when tens of millions or maybe 100 million uh, sort of uh, a euro deal is going to be made. So uh, I'm very excited uh, in the ways in which this whole world of sport is, is heading. I'm in touch with a young generation, the, you know, the Gen Z, that is consuming sport and football and content in a very different way to somebody like me. I'm 47, I'll soon be 50. You know, my kids are 8, 10, and 12. They are huge uh, sort of uh, athletes in their own right. You know, I'm working very hard on getting them to get, end up at the U.S. colleges and eventually kind of get a sports scholarship in their chosen football, uh, chosen sports. So I fully understand as a consumer, as an executive, as an older generation, uh, by really engaging and talking with the younger generation and what it is that makes them, you know, really engage with the world of sport, entertainment, media. And uh, I think we saw last week a huge announcement between Cosmos Tennis, uh, which is owned by Edmund True and Gerard Piquet, doing a, a big, big deal with uh, Socios in Chile's. Uh, we have seen the way in which Socios in Chile's have really taken the sporting industry uh, in the direction where it wasn't uh, anywhere near that two years ago. So uh, I think it's exciting times ahead. Uh, you know, we, we are making some interesting inroads into the world of uh, sport. There are emergence of amazing new VCs, such as Ludus Capital. It, it's, it's, it's an investment fund, uh, you know, full of founders, investors, entrepreneurs, technologists, who really, and celebrities uh, from, from LA, who really understand the power of what's happening in the world of sports and media in the forthcoming years. Blogsport is also uh, invested in by CVC, venture capital firm, which has got almost 200 billion assets under management, and also the ownership structure uh, that owns seven football clubs in Europe. And the reason why I'm a great fan, obviously, being part of Blogsport is because he has not only been supported by the media guys when it comes down to the investment. He has also been invested in by the group that owns seven football clubs in Europe. And I think it's a very different ball game when your investors are only media and tech investors uh, versus when your investors are a combination of the biggest VCs in the world and also those who manage and run football clubs and fully understand the power of data. Because I think the power of data today uh, was, as I mentioned, whether it's in health, whether it's in, 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 in athlet, uh, you know, athleticism, or whether it's in anything else uh, to do with media is, is incredibly, incredibly important. So I would like to sort of end on this point, Mark, and sort of maybe allow you and anybody else from the audience to ask any direct questions, and then maybe we can go through a little bit more in depth uh, in, the, in the next part uh, as part of the interview. Yes, yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much so far for your presentation. Uh, if there are like any chat, uh, any, any questions, please uh, feel free to post them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I, I would have a question. Um, for You mentioned that uh, a, a smaller club can kind of outplay the bigger ones by collecting the, di the right data and even use it as a revenue stream. Like how exactly, like which data is, uh, um, what data do you I'm thinking of the health data, the, the player analysis, uh, or, or, or what can the smaller club do to compete with the bigger ones? Um, well, the data I was referring to uh, for the smaller clubs, or any size clubs, is the basically the fund base that they have. I think if they plug in a sports tech solutions, they can really develop all elements of uh, new revenue streams rather than the data that Rasmus Ankesen did with the players by really analyzing the performance of the players and the value of the squad when the club is actually up for sale. That's a very different ball game, and that's maybe a thing of the past and the future at the same time in terms of the uh, sort of performance uh, enhancement. However, the, the data I'm talking about is the, the data they hold uh, when it comes down to their fans. And I think if they uh, utilize the data uh, that they, they hold as fans on their social media channels, they can create a, a really new uh, aspects of the fan engagement. They can set up fan missions. They can integrate the data of their fans uh, with the social betting, as well as the betting partners, because ultimately the world of sport 
uh, uh, really kind of breeds elements of, of sort of betting. That's not something that any of us invented here. However, it's become a huge revenue stream for the clubs and has made many, many clubs actually survive. So you can also um, educate uh, people when it comes down to the social betting aspect of it. You don't necessarily need to go after their money and after their deep pockets, uh, but you can really even enable your fans to have a sort of opportunity to discuss and talk to your captain, to your uh, head coach, to your chairman. You can really open up that communication channel, which was never really the case in the world of football or sport in the past. And then, of course, you can reward them in different ways by, you know, really kind of throwing in various raffle prices, etc. So the, the data I'm talking about is what the clubs are sitting on, which is their fan base, on their Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all other social media platforms, and really making that uh, relationship work for the benefit of the fans as well as the benefit of the club. Okay, okay. So to have like the, uh, to increase the fan engagement, to be closer to the fans, and then, um, yeah, kind of maybe also sell your merchandise or whatever, like in, in this way. Okay, sweet. And uh, I think we had uh, a question from Joe in the chat. Um, like, oh, are you particularly keen on particular sports for your kids <laughs> or just what they like? <laughs> so I think that, you know, like in the languages, um, Latin is the, is the sort of base of most, at least European languages. Uh, I think in the in life mathematics is the base of uh, you know not because I studied it but uh, you know mathematics taught me about the system theory about psychology because stats and probability psychology is based on stats and probability and human behavior. In athletics uh, is the most important thing that I push across to my own kids. So my daughter who's 12 who's a nike ambassador she's a mental health campaigner she's an advisor to the london may on the things related to the london teenagers she's also on the england pathway to become a national player for england hockey team and however although she's a striker she's a very strong uh, a sort of uh, and skillful uh, young lady uh, one thing that's really helped her hockey was her athletics because she's a cross-country runner and she's endurance sprinter. So her disciplines are 400 and 800 meters on the track. And that element of athletics, which is very much what we as a family promote, the, the sort of mental uh, well-being is incredibly important. And uh, last night uh, I, I, I went through the presentation of uh, our hockey team sort of coach, who was uh, in, in a national coach of many international teams, including Spain as the head coach, uh, et cetera. Uh, he talked about the importance of a technical ability, uh, a sort of endurance and sort of physical ability, but also mind, uh, mind well-being. And, and uh, we as a family have been promoting the importance of physical activity for the mental well-being. So I would encourage all the kids, no matter how good or bad they think they are, to really embrace themselves in athletics, because athletics will help them to really showcase the stamina and endurance when it comes down to football, to basketball, because, you know, a coach friend of mine uh, who was with a, a, a junior world champions uh, uh, of the world, Swedish, uh, actually Danish team, um, he said to me that uh, only two or three minutes a game, the players will touch the ball at the most. So if you think about the amount of running, and I spoke to another friend of mine this morning whose son plays at the, at the top level uh, football, and he's being tracked every second of the way in order to see how much he's actually run during the match. So unless, and if you look at the English premiership, it is really a physical game. It's a game of the gladiators. So it's no longer that you can just outskill somebody and that's the only thing that's good enough for you to actually go to the top level. Athletics is key. So as I mentioned, Latin for languages, athletics for sport. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it makes sense because if you just set up the fundamentals right and then you can go there if you have the right endurance and as sprinting power, you can uh, yeah, kind of join all the other team sports later on. It makes sense. 
And we have another question from M. Uh, if we were to fast forward 10 years down the line, what's your dream for athletes? And uh, how would you hope uh, to sport industry involves? How do you hope the sport industry involves? Like, so what, what is your vision for the sports industry for, for the next 10 years? I think athletes are increasingly, as somebody who works closely with also athletes and their agents and the commercial brands, and we kind of uh, uh, promote different initiatives. Uh, you know, we recently did a, a, a sort of a, a Mo Farah. Mo Farah is Olympic champion, uh, uh, so five and 10,000 meter runner. They won the, the four Olympic golds. Uh, we did his first TED talk. Now, why did we do a TED talk, which was supported by Huawei, uh, the Chinese uh, superpower, a sort of uh, a brand that has, you know, uh, all sorts of, uh, I guess, positive and negative uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, reputation around it is because I think athletes of today and tomorrow ought to look at uh, them being able to inspire the next generation, be able to get out there and become a lot more about the society, a lot more about the, the sort of the world we live in, not just to do with their own roots, because many of these successful athletes come from a very humble beginnings. And often they have an entire village, uh, families uh, that depend on them and their, their success. So the pressure is really intense. But I'd like to see athletes go beyond that. I'd like to see them go beyond the boundaries of their own countries, beyond the boundaries or even their own continents, because we live in a very connected world. We are all part of the global village and a success and fame comes for a reason. I tell my own kids, if you ever become successful or famous, uh, that's a, 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 a platform that God or somebody has given you because it wasn't all done by yourself. You need a huge infrastructure around you and you need to use that to make a positive impact in other people's lives. Because, you know, we hear from today to tomorrow, you know, whether we live for 50, 100, even 150 years, it doesn't really matter. It's a relatively short period of time. And we all have the responsibility to make a positive impact in the world we live in, however small or big it is, but the responsibility is there. So I'd like to see athletes doing that. I'd like the sporting industry, uh, as football in particular, as the most watched and often compared to the biggest religion of the world to do the same thing. And of course, we've seen with various projects and initiatives that football clubs and footballers are doing a great deal. As you all know, Rashford was the driving force behind the meals for the kids from the uh, very poor backgrounds during the COVID times so when the government stopped issuing the meals to them during the, the sort of break times in between the schools. He campaigned and managed to convince the government that they should uh, give the poor and the poorest of the society the ability to feed themselves because there are millions of kids in the United Kingdom who only eat when they go to school because their parents are too poor to be able to feed them. So they turn up to school hungry, they have a meal at school. So imagine when you break up from school and you go home and your, your family hasn't got the food on the table. It's a very, very difficult situation because we cannot learn and educate ourselves if we, have, if we are malnutrition and if we don't have the energy in us. So I think we all have the responsibilities and I'd like to uh, sort of end with that, that I'd like to see athletes and sports clubs doing more in that direction. Thank you very much, very insightful. And it's true, like sport, especially like prominent sport figures, has been like always important for social changes uh, back in history. It's, if it's discrimination of gender, of race, of uh, whatever, you can just even see it with Sebastian Vettel and the, um, uh, the, the Grand Prix um, in August. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, also when it comes to technical technical adoption, um, sport is like also like a, a key player to also make aware of sp uh, specific uh, yeah, is issues which are not uh, as, as they should be. 